Savvy Business Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with our host, Christina Nichman. Our guest today is Callum Lang, New Zealander who has started, built, bought, and sold half a dozen businesses in a range of industries across two continents. He is a partner in private equity company Unity Group, director of multiple companies, and is co-founder and non-exec director of the marketing group PLC. Today, Callum shares how to build your small business with minimal risk and liquidity. Find out more at CallumLang.com. Hi, Callum. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. We're so happy to have you back. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's been a couple of years. I'm looking forward to chatting again. Oh, you betcha. And you've been a, a quite busy bee doing some amazing stuff out there. You've written, well, you've written a number of best-selling books, but you have progressive partnerships and more recently, uh, agglomerate idea to IPO in 12 months, which really pertains to our audience, which is small businesses. And you're going to share with small businesses how they can really explode and expand and grow. Um, before we go to sharing all those goodies, share with the audience a little bit about your backstory and where, how you came to where you are today. Yeah, sure. So um, I think we, we spoke sort of uh, two, two and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I've been an entrepreneur for, well, uh, as, a, as a kid, I was always hustling and, and mm-hmm. setting up little, little small businesses. Um, but kind of as a, as a relative grown up, for the, for the last 20 years, I've had various different businesses in uh, multiple different industries and different countries. And uh, some of them have been relatively successful and some of them have been complete disasters, as, as you mm-hmm. expect. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, I've spent mm-hmm. nearly 20 years here in, in Asia and, and just managed to build up a, a very big community of small business owners. And so I'm kind of very conscious of, of the challenges that uh, that face small businesses and that sort of brought us up to today where I, I try to solve uh, some of those biggest challenges. Yeah. And I don't recall if we spoke about in the first interview, is there a reason that you got pulled towards uh, Asia and, and, and that arena, that area in particular? Yes, yeah, so I've always been a bit of a business geek, um, and so I was kind of looking at the at the big macro trends that were happening in the world, and and even kind of back twenty years ago, it was clear that you've kind of got this biggest the biggest shift in wealth in the history of mankind is going from west to east, um, and it just seemed to me to make more sense to be on the on the receiving end than on the giving. <laughs> Giving in, so uh, yeah, moved moved over here and um, absolutely love it. Yeah, it makes complete sense, and I I have seen that explosion in in China and in Singapore where you are. It's, it's amazing the amazing growth, and I'm happy. I mean, yeah, I want to see this growth all over the planet. And the way yeah. I've always felt about small businesses is where that is where mankind can really explode and expand through the use of like entrepreneurship it. and small business. And but often, as we talked about in the first interview, we don't get past year five, and uh, we have great ambitions, we have talents, we have gifts skills, but they never make it out of the stall. Uh, what are some of those reasons that cause people not to really explode and expand the way they should? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really, really interesting time. I think, um, uh, yeah, th- there is so much disruption and there's so many opportunities for mm-hmm. small businesses in, in all of these different niches. Um, but it's just really difficult. <laughs> it's, it's insanely difficult to to create a, a repeatable, successful business model. And I think um, you know, right now, the, the the world's very obsessed with uh, tech startups, and and that's all kind of fun and cool, and it's <laughs> bets on bets on the future and all of that sort of stuff. But what I found was my network and my peers were people that were building. Less glamorous, but but actual real businesses. It could you know it could be a, a hairdresser or an accountant or a marketing company or um, you know these kind of businesses. And these entrepreneurs would build these businesses up maybe over five, ten, twenty years, um, and they would be good businesses with good clients, good brands, good good revenues. But the entrepreneur still wasn't making any money. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they, they could be doing like two, three, four, five million in turnover, mm-hmm. which from the outside looks like they must be very successful. Yeah. 
um, but, but when you talk to them, uh, you know, they're creating so much value for everyone else that, you know, if you're doing a few million in revenue, mm-hmm. you're creating huge value for your clients. You're creating huge value for your team and their families. Mm-hmm. You've got a whole ecosystem of suppliers and partners and landlords that all extract value from your business every day because you get up and go to work. Mm-hmm. Yet as the founder, it's so hard for you to take any cash off, off the table as a, as a reward. Um, and so that was kind of one of these, these big challenges that, that we kept seeing. And uh, it gets to the point where entrepreneurs tend to kind of, you know, we, we sort of signed up for that as entrepreneurs. We knew it was going to be hard. Yeah. Um, but you get to this point and you just go, you know what? I'm creating so much value for everyone else. I'm not getting anything out of this. Mm. Um, what are my options? And, and unfortunately, that, that's oftentimes the first time people have looked around and thought about the exit in, in any mm-hmm. sort of real sense. Um, and, and what they discover is it's, it's even more depressing mm-hmm. um, because there's very few people want to buy small businesses. Uh, um, and, and what's happening right now is another one of these demographic shifts, these big mega trends, is that 70% of all small businesses are owned by baby boomers. Mm-hmm. Um, and baby boomers want to retire. Uh, yeah, they, they wanted to sell their business for millions and, and sit on the beach. Yeah. Um, but if you've got all of these businesses coming up for sale at once, Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the, the the other problem is that on the other side of that equation, it's now so cheap and easy to start your own business uh-huh. that people perceive it as more risky to go and buy an established business. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the, those two things kind of come together, and and suddenly the the founder finds themselves with with very little options. Um, yeah. And I guess that the, the one that sort of the option that, that might be there is to sell yourself to a bigger competitor. Yeah. Um, well, let me stop but, you right here because it's interesting no. what, you, what you're talking about because I've spoken to a number of business owners on the show and outside the show, and it's very frustrating. I, I talk to them, and one of the things I get back from them is that I'm pretty much now working for my business, not the other way around. It's not working for me. I have employees I'm responsible for. In fact, I'm working for it even more because now I'm working 24-7 instead of getting off at 5 or whatever your time frame is. Um, but also, I talked to someone recently who got his business business up to several million and he went to talk to a capital firm hoping to get some more capital liquid in his company and they said well we don't deal with anyone that doesn't make at least 300 million so later (laughs) and I'm like he was like whoa and I thought I was doing pretty good with myself uh, (laughs) yeah so we understand what you're talking about here when you say that hey I don't make 300 million will I ever get there but you have come up and, and your partners have come up with a wonderful way in which it can serve small businesses. Uh, and that's um, presented in your book, uh, Glomerate, idea to IPO in 12 months. Share a little bit about the idea about how you can build that community you were talking about. Yeah. So, so this was kind of a, a realization that there's a lot of businesses in that situation. Um, and, and they face this uh, you know, they've got this challenge about how do they extract value. But they've also got a challenge that we call the scale paradox. And the scale paradox is that as a small business, you can't go for the really big contracts. Uh, and because you can't get the really big contracts, you remain a small business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can't attract the really good staff that would help you grow to the next level. And because you can't attract the really good staff, you, you know, so, so you're in this, this scale paradox. Mm-hmm. And what we were seeing a lot of in our own network was people kind of giving up and selling themselves to bigger players or joining kind of roll-ups to go public in the hope that that might, might help. Mm-hmm. Um, but oftentimes, yeah, nine times out of 10, what you end up with is an accountant telling an entrepreneur how they should run their business. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, no, no offense to accountants, but <laughs> it's, it's more about entrepreneurs. We're just not very good at being told what to do. Um, and so oftentimes the, the entrepreneur ends up getting fired from their own business or you know, leaving after six months. They don't get the, the terms of their deal. And, and it was all kind of not, not a great solution. Um, so basically what we did is we created a publicly listed company. In fact, we have multiple of them uh, in different mm-hmm. markets around the world. 
exclusively for the use of good entrepreneurs. So we, we find companies that are debt-free, they're profitable, they're well-run, and the founders can swap their private stock, their private equity for public equity, but then they carry on running the business exactly the same as before. So it's their brand, it's their hiring and firing, it's their culture. Nothing changes. They, they keep full control. But now when they go and pitch for business, they're a $200 million or if they don't want, want capital, they're a $300 million global business rather than a $5 million local entity. Um, when they want to attract senior staff, they can offer them real tangible public stock mm -hmm. as, a, as an incentive. And for the founder, if they want to sell 5% of their business and buy a house, they can do that finally. You know, it, it actually gives them that liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, a, it's a really nice solution to mm -hmm. um, solving that, that problem that small businesses face. Wow. It, when I heard about it, I was like, wow, this is like the perfect solution uh, for a lot of small businesses out there that, as you said, have the skill, have the talent and have this great value that they're bringing to the world that is being wasted and squandered and oftentimes has to go out of business or losing that value. And how many great businesses are, are going out of business on a daily basis around the globe that we're losing. And now we have an option for them. Uh, how are you using this yourself? Are you you yourself going to look for businesses or do they come find you? How does that work? And how did you find or come across this idea? Yeah, so I mean, the, the idea was sort of, a, nothing about the idea is, is unique on its own, but putting mm -hmm. it together the way that we've done, I, I haven't seen anyone else do. And I think the biggest point is that we're entrepreneurs. And so we have a very strong belief that the best people to run business businesses are the entrepreneurs themselves. Um, yeah, so, so hardwired into all our contracts is that they have final say over how they, they continue to, to own the business and control it. Um, so I think that that was kind of what's unique. Most most finance people will look at this model and say, yeah, it's great, but you know what you should do? You should you need to rein in the entrepreneurs. You need to rebrand everyone. You need to consolidate all the finance functions. But again, you're back to an accountant and telling an entrepreneur how to run their business. So mm -hmm. I think that the reason we came up with it was solving a problem for, for us and our, our peers. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually we've, we're just this year where, um, we've found another way to, to really take this to a whole new level. And I think with mm -hmm. the, your, your financial background, you'll, you'll find this very interesting. So uh -huh. we just, just by nature of the, the problem that we were solving, we had a lot of companies come to us. Mm -hmm. saying they wanted to be a part of it. Um, and, and both myself and my business partner have kind of a, a quite strong network of small businesses. So that was never a problem. Um, but what we were finding were a lot of these businesses, even if they were doing well, you know, two, three million in profit, mm -hmm. they would still be looking to have a capital injection into their, their business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they had opportunities overseas or they want to develop something. Um, and the agglomeration model didn't really solve that. It, it gave them liquidity and it gave them scale, but it didn't actually inject capital into the business. So what we're launching at the moment is something called accelerated venture capital. Hmm. So this is a separate uh, entity. It's a, it's a venture capital firm. But the venture capital firm will only invest in these small businesses that are about to join the agglomeration. Mm. So what, what that means for the company that's joining the agglomeration is that, you know, for, for ease of maths, if they're doing a million in profit, uh, the accelerated venture capital could inject up to five million in operating capital. Which uh, you know, which is uh, you means you can now become a public company and have a war chest to go out and expand and, and do all that. Um, for the public company itself, uh, they can announce to the market, right? We've just acquired a million dollars in reoccurring profit and five million dollars of net cash. Um, and we've paid for that in sort of three or four million in stock, which you know, <laughs> there's no other public company in the world that could announce deals of that value. It's, it's mm -hmm. kind of fantastic. So you get an immediate boost in everybody's share value. Um, and then for the, the accelerated venture capital, um, they, 
their investment has now got liquid sort of in the space of, of days mm. rather than yeah, most venture capital invest in a company and then pray for 10 years that they're <laughs> going to get an exit <laughs> at the end of it. Well, this, this venture capital arm only in, invests in companies that are going to be acquired later that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so yeah. so uh, they can rotate that money very, very quickly and, and use it again and again and again for, for more and more small businesses. Um, so it's, that's really the, the agglomeration model is kind of the core of it. But this accelerated venture capital is um, it's almost like puts it on steroids and just uh, oh, wow. re- re- really allows small businesses to, to flourish. Because I think, um, you know, if we, can, if we can help a few small businesses go from 5 million in revenue to 50 million in revenue, mm-hmm. yeah, that has a huge impact on, on jobs and the economy. Mm-hmm. And, it does. Uh, all yeah. sorts of things. It's so it's so mag- magnificent and amazing. Even the people I talk to who are not business owners, they often don't see the impact that hey, if a thousand businesses around the globe that are you're dependent upon for your daily goods, let's say the stuff you buy in your refrigerator or the car you buy or whatever it might be, all go out of business. It affects everyone around the globe. At this mm. point in time, we're really a global um, community. It's not, you can't uh, see it any other way. So what really I I'm really jazzed about what I'm hearing here is that the fact that entrepreneurs get to run their own business and the fact that, as you said, it's um, venture capitalism on steroids here because now overnight, instead of waiting to see if this, you know, you'll get liquid in, in five to 10 years, you, within a couple of days, you can start moving things. And one of the things I heard from business owners growing, like that guy I told you about that spoke to oh. a venture capitalist firm and they said, I'm sorry, we only talk to people that make uh, 300 million or more. Uh, <laughs> he said, it's frustrating for us just as you said in the beginning of the interview that we want to grow further and we want to go globally and start going into other markets like Asia and and not just stay in the United States, but that requires setting up satellite offices, getting staff abroad, of course, requiring a lot of capital. So this is such an awesome solution. Yeah, so look, point him in my direction because he's, he's exactly what what we uh, we would love to help. Um, and I think uh, one of, one of the other interesting things is we we set this business up because it, it was to solve a need amongst our peers. And and one of the things that we discovered as we kind of went through this this process is it's a really big disconnect between the finance world who says things like, "Yeah, come back when you're making three hundred million." <laughs> Um, like, like, you know, that's an easy thing <laughs> to, to do. Yeah. Um, and, and all of these hardworking small business owners that, that are actually building all the value. And, mm-hmm. and what's happening is if you think about it from the finance point of view, mm-hmm. investors don't like investing in small business because it's risky and it's illiquid. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you put a group of small businesses together into a public entity like an agglomeration, mm-hmm. suddenly it's not risky because you've de-risked it amongst a, a portfolio of companies mm-hmm. um, and it's completely liquid because it's, it's public. So suddenly you can reconnect all of this cash that's washing around out there in, in the finance world with the people that are actually creating the value and actually doing the work. Um, and, and right now the, there's this massive disconnect and, and you know, part of the reason why you've got so many silly derivatives and all of these kind of bets on bets of outcomes is because it's just so difficult for, for finance to, to inject itself into uh, where the value is being created. So, yeah, ho- hopefully we can kind of help uh, people like your friend and yeah. uh, a lot of other businesses. Yeah, and what's amazing about this is that um, when you said a group of businesses, if one business starts to suffer, since you're in a conglomerate, if one starts to suffer, you're, it's not hurt to anyone investing in it because, hey, you've got all these other companies that will keep it going until this one gets back on its feet. It recalls to me our first conversation when we talked about, hey, if you're going to run a business, make sure you don't just have all your eggs in one basket. Have several different offerings or different uh, values that you give to your client as well as different um, um, revenue streams coming in at all times. I remember you mentioning that and this goes along with the same thing. This makes it so powerful because it's kind of like a net because you have more than one um, basket or one way to bring in cash flow and and in this case, more than one way for um, more than one way to have businesses all come together to help serve each other. 
Yeah, totally. And, and so from an investor standpoint, it's de-risked. Uh, like, I mean, small businesses are risky. You know, <laughs> small businesses fall over. It, it, you, know, you lose yeah. two major clients or two key staff members. Yeah. You have your worst year ever. Um, but the nice thing about this model is that within that group, you've got 20, 50, 100 other small businesses that also have a vested interest in your success. Mm-hmm. So if you, um, and there's full transparency within within the group, so if you put your hand up and say, hey, look, we've just lost our biggest client, uh-huh. well, you're going to have other people in the room that, that don't want this to be your worst year ever. So they'll, they'll put their hand up and say, well, look, if you've got some senior staff you want to lend to me to get them off their off your payroll for a few months, yeah, you know, I'd be happy to take them. Or mm-hmm. do you want to come and share an office with us so that we can cut some costs down? Okay. Um, so I, that just, yeah, as somebody that went through the, the global financial crisis on my own as an entrepreneur and, and ended up having to lay off a lot of staff, yeah, it's really tough. So, so just being in an environment where you've kind of got a bunch of other smart multi-million dollar entrepreneurs that have a vested interest in helping you um, is, a, is a really nice sort of support mechanism that, that mostly entrepreneurs never, never get to tap into. That's absolutely true. And what this is recalling for me, this is kind of like bringing back the village community-based ideals of you don't have to be strapping it to your back and doing it all by yourself. It can be a village working together to grow a big one business, you know, a bunch of businesses becoming one and growing together where we all support each other and it's not just all on your back. Yeah, totally. And actually, the the two books that I've um, written, and and I'll make both of them uh, available as free downloads for your listeners. Thank you. Um, But they they both basically the the sort of the thesis of both of them is that we're moving from a period of competition into a period of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Um, And and the first book, Progressive Partnerships, is all about how small businesses can collaborate, and yeah, it could be building a community around your brand or your product and how that could add another 5, 10, 15 grand a month. Um, and then the, the, the next book, Agglomerate, is really about how you take that up a level. So rather than uh, partnering with products and services, you're, you're partnering with other businesses in, in the commercial or in the public markets. Um, but, I, but I really believe that we're, we're in this situation where um, you've got so many small businesses that are so talented at what they do, but on their own, they're very vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and, and when you collaborate, when you take that uh, approach of collaboration over competition, suddenly you've got so much. It's, it's so powerful. Wow. And I'm guessing this could even help a small business owner that's been out a year or less because you're just getting started. You're probably not all that profitable getting started, but you can use these same principles, help, you know, working together as entrepreneurs coming together in community instead of being against each other. Because I don't know if we mentioned this in our our last interview, but when I first got started and I would go to networking events, it was this severe kind of feel of competition. I've got to get that guy's clients and I got to beat him to get the, you know, the, the uh, sales over here instead of realizing that maybe as entrepreneurs, even if we're getting started, we can find other people to collaborate with and be in partnership with and not do it alone. Totally. And I think, I mean, my, my first book is a, is a great read for, I would say that, um, for, but, but for, for companies that are, are early, early stage businesses, because it, it really talks about that, that collaboration. And, and look, there's always going to be people out there that, that are competitive and they're kind of mm. scarcity mindset and no, no, you're a competitor. Um, but actually, if you look at anyone that has any level of success, um, they've all figured out how, how to collaborate. I mean, if you look at the trajectory of any successful business, mm. you can pinpoint where it's done these, these strategic partnerships uh, that's allowed it to go to the next level. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really – once you get into that mindset of, uh, you know, there's tons of opportunities out there, yeah. uh, and maybe if there was five companies going and pitching for the business together rather than me claiming I can do everything, uh, mm. then actually, you know, we could get a much, much bigger slice of the pie rather than, uh, you know, just, just the bit that's on offer. Absolutely. And I'm guessing one question I got in the past speaking to business owners is you often 
you're new business owners, you start hanging out with other new business owners and you're all kind of in the same pot. You're all are just getting started and don't know what you don't know. What would you suggest to people just getting started and and they're like, I I have a great talent. I have a skill. I want to start this business. Where do I go where I don't have a lot of liquid, perhaps a lot of cash in my bank account, but I want to make sure that, that this can be profitable. Okay. So uh, one of the most controversial articles I, I wrote uh, um, was I used to get invited to go and speak at a lot of startup events <laughs> and judge startup events. And I finally got a bit frustrated um, and I wrote this article to the next web and it basically said, don't call yourself a startup and stop hanging around with other startups. <laughs> um, and, and my premise was that basically uh, outside of Silicon Valley, a startup is is basically announcing to the world you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, you know, the, the hardest thing in business is credibility. Uh, the minute you define yourself as a startup, you, you're telling your clients and your staff, your potential staff and all these guys that, that you're at the beginning of the journey. You, you don't know what you're doing. So, so stop calling yourself a startup. Um, and the second thing is stop hanging around with other startups. Uh, it, you know, it's very com- uh, yeah, compelling to go and commiserate about how tough it is with, with other people, but mm. they don't know what they're doing either. <laughs> right? You, yeah. you want to be hanging around with successful business owners. Um, you want to be hanging around with your clients. Uh, the, these are the people that, uh, that that will really make the, the difference. Uh, um, so uh, mm-hmm. basically, that, that article insulted all of the next web's readership. So it, it got quite <laughs> quite a lot. Of it. it went a bit viral, um, and yeah. now I don't. Now I don't get invited to speak at startup events anymore. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, but there's a good bit of advice in that. I mean, I've heard it said that if you want to fly like an eagle, you don't hang out with ducks and chickens. So it's kind yeah. of the same thing. If you're in a, if you want to be the, here, wherever your location or where you want to end up, you don't hang out where where you are. You have to push yourself and be a little uncomfortable and hang out with people who... Cause, I know for me, when I started pushing myself and, and doing speaking events, we brought Savvy on the road to Manhattan and did these networking business events where we interview our audience in front of a live um, business audience. It's uncomfortable uh, hanging out with you know people who are out there and growing. And But you know, just get out there and get uncomfortable because uh, that's the only way you're going to start soaring. <laughs> yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And, and you know, you do it a few times and then that starts becoming your new comfort. And then you have yeah. to go and find something else that uh, pushes you a little little bit harder. Exactly. Um, I think one of the uh, the myths, a good, good friend of mine, Daniel Priestley, is, is good at destroying entrepreneurial myths. But one, <laughs> one of the um, myths that most entrepreneurs have is that it'll be easier in mm. the future. <laughs> you know what? Once I get to a few million, or once I get to ten staff, or once I get to fifty staff, it'll be so much easier. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it just it gets progressively harder. The problems get progressively bigger. Um, it's it's like being uh, the, the the analogy he uses is being a boxer. You know, you win one boxing fight, um, and you go on to the next mm-hmm. bigger, better competitor, and they just hit harder. Yeah. Uh, um, but but you know that's that's the game that we we signed up for and and then when you look back and you, you think those first amateur fights you're like, wow you know, that was that was easy the stuff I did five years ago why was I so worried about it yeah. it was uh, yeah, so easy so uh, yeah no it's um, you're constantly uh, pushing yourself and and uh, striving harder yeah. well that's what makes the journey so exciting uh, who wants it to be easy I mean people often think I want to get to wherever that idea of success is but then what we're supposed to on the beach and just rot away it's like no it's an ever-ending journey of ex- exploration and growth and it's awesome uh, but you know we are coming to the end of our time here Callum and it's been so awesome having you back to share your great gifts That's and wisdom perfect. before we leave share with our audience a little bit about where they can get your awesome books and find out more about you yeah, so um, in the I guess in, in your show notes, I'll include a link. But if anyone drops me an email on cl at callumlang dot com, c a w l u m l a i n g dot com, um, and just mention this this uh, recording, Savvy Radio, uh, I'll send you a, a couple of links so that you can download both of my books. Oh, that's so fabulous. Well, I thank you so much, Callum. It's such a great gift. And I'm so grateful that you were able to come out here tonight and share a little bit of your wisdom. It's been fabulous. Thank you so much for coming back to Savvy Business Radio. 
Absolute pleasure. And I look forward to doing it again in a few years. You betcha. <laughs> Savvy Business Radio broadcasts worldwide via a large podcast network celebrating business owners, entrepreneurs, influencers, and successful individuals. Find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest. Call 732-474-7375 or email Christina at SavvyBusinessRadio.com.